Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday rundown of all things relating to Starship development, launch news and events from the past week, and a preview of all the flights expected over the next seven days. We've had a really busy week this time, so there's lots to discuss. Let's begin, as we always do, with Starship development news. The biggest news this week was undoubtedly the beginning of Booster 4's test campaign. Last week, it was lifted by Crane onto the launch table, where it was then clamped in place. We can see in this footage of a previous lift of Booster 4 that the Raptor engines look a little bit exposed, but we can now see that SpaceX have made good progress installing aerodynamic shielding around the Raptors. There's still some work to go, I imagine, but it's looking great so far. Of course, long term, the chopstick arms will be used to move the booster, which will be quicker and more reliable than the Crane, since they can hold the booster much more securely and from more attachment points. Not long after the booster was installed on the pad, testing begun. No static fires yet so far, unfortunately, but we did see a cryoproofing test which appeared to go well. With cryoproofing and ambient pressure testing complete, we'll see a static fire on the cards very soon. I'm not exactly sure how this static fire will go. Presumably SpaceX won't fire all 29 engines at once, at least initially, but we'll have to wait and see. I'd imagine that they'd start with only a small number of engines involved in a static fire before gradually building up to get to that full 29 engine roar. One item that SpaceX will want to monitor closely is how the engines will interact with each other during a static fire test. Elon Musk won Time's Person of the Year last week, and during an interview for the award he mentioned a scenario of an engine catching fire, and that SpaceX would want to ensure that if a fire breaks out, it doesn't spread through the entire volume. And speaking of the engines, look at this video shared by Elon Musk on Twitter showing the central cluster showing off their gimbal capabilities. This is how the rocket will steer itself in flight. The central engines can adjust their angle to keep the rocket on course, something that's very visible during the flight tests of earlier prototypes such as SN8. Last week we did see some rumours about the status of Booster 4 and whether or not it's been relegated to ground tests only. Elon since confirmed on Twitter that SpaceX are still aiming to use Booster 4 and Ship 20 for the first orbital flight test, though Elon's tweets and promises don't always end up being too accurate. How's that SN16 hypersonic flight test coming along, guys? Well, okay, fine, he did say might in this tweet, but regardless, while I'd like to say it's unlikely that Ship 20 and Booster 4 are no longer planned for flight, it's an area of interest that I'll be watching closely. Ship 20 had its nose cone hardpoints removed last week, meaning that it's now tantalizingly close to being completely actually finally done. Just some tiles left to install now in their place. Taking Ship 20 as an example actually, and looping back to the rumours that it's scrapped, one reason why SpaceX might not be using it for an orbital flight test now is because the chopstick arms on the tower aren't close to being ready. There's a possibility that they might be used during Booster 4's latest occupation of the launch pad to test their lift capabilities, but they will be essential for the first orbital flight test. This is because the arms are really the only way of lifting the Starship vehicle to the top of the booster for stacking. I know we've seen Ship 20 stacked on the booster before, but this was done using a crane that SpaceX no longer have, and the current current fleet of cranes are simply not tall enough to accomplish this task. Plus, hard points are required for a crane lift and Ship 20 doesn't have these anymore. I really, really hope that we do still get to see Booster 4 and Ship 20 fly together, but I am watching news developments here with bated breath. As for future vehicles, Ship 21 has had its nose cone completed, and we should start seeing this vehicle begin stacking in the high bay soon. I imagine Booster 7, whose sections have already been spotted around the site, will also start stacking soon as the next Super Heavy, as Booster 5 has apparently been scrapped already and Booster 6 has been converted to a test tank. Maria Pointer caught this great shot of Booster BN 2.1 being fitted in to the so-called can crusher rig. This is a rig that'll test the compression strength of the tank in order to simulate the immense pressure it'll be subjected to during an orbital launch. The can crusher rig could be the destiny of Booster 6, but at this point we don't quite know what that particular prototype will be used for. Elon stated on Twitter that beyond the prototypes currently undergoing construction, some major changes are being made to the Starship's design. Chiefly, it'll now have nine engines instead of six, three C-level engines with gimbal as before, but now they'll have six fixed vacuum engines instead of three. Interestingly, this is the same as the very first proposed Starship design put forward by SpaceX, the Interplanetary Transport System, which you can see in this 2016 animation sports six vacuum engines used either all together or in clusters 
Starships of 3. In addition to the extra three engines, the new generation of Starship design will also have more fuel capacity and, this one of course we all knew, will use the Raptor 2 engine, production of which has now begun. Raptor 1 is a remarkable engine, it's the engine we've seen on all Starships thus far, but Raptor 2 will make it look archaic. For starters, it won't have the massive mess of cables around it that Raptor 1 has, according to Elon, and it'll produce over 40 more tons of thrust than Raptor 1. So there's lots of exciting things happening in Starship development over the course of 2022 to look forward to, but I'm also keeping Booster 4 and Ship 20 in my thoughts and prayers that they're still on for a flight and that Booster 5 may still be of some use to SpaceX, though I'm almost certain it won't be used for anything now. Watch this space. Anyway, Starship development wasn't the only thing to watch last week, we also had a bunch of launch news. Let's quickly recap that now, but before I do, I gotta shamelessly ask that if you are enjoying the video so far, then do consider leaving a like and a subscription down below to help support the channel and of course help you stay in the know with these update videos every single Monday. Anyway, onwards. <laughs> We had quite a few launches last week. The first two took place on Monday the 13th of December. One was a Proton M rocket, which was launched by Roscosmos from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. On board were two Express AMU communication satellites, which were successfully placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit. The other launch on Monday was from China. This was a Long March 3BE, which also launched to geosynchronous orbit. The payload for this mission was a single Tianlian 202 communication satellite. On the 15th of December, China launched a Kwaizu 1A rocket, which was supposed to place two GSAT-1 navigation satellites into low Earth orbit, but sadly the mission was lost due to a launch failure. Chinese state media didn't really go into too much detail, stating that abnormal performance was detected during the flight of the rocket and that the cause of the failure is under investigation. On the 18th and 19th of December, we saw some impressive stuff from SpaceX. On the 18th of December, the company launched their next 52 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit, which isn't a hugely interesting mission in and of itself considering how frequent they are, but this this was a special one because this flight marked this particular Falcon 9 first stage's 11th flight overall. A new record for Falcon. Here's to the next 11 flights. On the 19th of December, SpaceX then launched another Falcon 9. This was the TurkSat 5B mission, which placed the single TurkSat 5B satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit. This is a new record for the shortest amount of time between two SpaceX Falcon 9 launches at 15 hours and 17 minutes. And it's not going to be long before we see another Falcon 9 flight. Just a few days, in fact. Let's take a look at that and all the other launches expected this week. The first flight of the week is the aforementioned Falcon 9, which will launch from the Kennedy Space Center on the 21st of December. The primary payload will be the commercial resupply service mission to the International Space Station using a Cargo Dragon spacecraft. Secondary payloads include five technology demonstration CubeSats and an ionospheric research CubeSat, all of which will be placed into a low Earth orbit. On the 22nd of December, a Japanese H-2 rocket will launch from the Tanegashima launch site, carrying a single Inmarsat communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The same day, Virgin Orbit will launch their Above the Clouds mission, which will see their air-launched Launcher 1 rocket deploy four CubeSats to low Earth orbit. These are an Austrian space debris measuring CubeSat, an American and a British technology demonstration CubeSat, and a Polish Earth observation CubeSat. On the 23rd of December, Russia will launch an Angara A5 rocket with the Perse upper stage. This will be the first flight of the Perse upper stage, a Block DM-03 upper stage variant for the Angara launch vehicle. Angara itself is a developed mental rocket and will eventually replace the Proton launch vehicle for Roscosmos, a rocket which uses highly toxic propellants and has been known to have some reliability issues. Hopefully this latest test launch goes well. On the 24th of December, we have a big one. Yes, you all know what I'm talking about. This is the launch of the long-awaited James Webb Space Telescope. This was jointly developed by NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Once operational, it'll replace the aging Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched all the way back in 1990. The James Webb Telescope will have a main mirror that's six and a half meters or 21 feet in diameter, which is six times larger than Hubble's. So large, in fact, that it needs to be split into 18 pieces that all fold together during the launch so that it can fit inside the fairing of the Ariane 5 rocket that'll be launching it. The telescope will mainly use 
infrared light, hence the gold plating since gold reflects infrared very well, but the telescope also works in the red part of the visible light spectrum. It'll be able to see things far beyond what Hubble can, but to work it needs to be kept as cool as possible, and it's therefore protected by a very large sun shield the size of a tennis court. The Ariane 5 launch vehicle will place the telescope into a very special orbit, beyond the moon at the second Lagrange point of the Sun-Earth system, a place of stable gravity. This orbit is about four times further away from Earth than the moon. It needs to be far away from us to avoid heat radiating from the Earth and moon. The telescope won't actually be going around the Earth like a conventional orbiting satellite, but instead it's going to orbit the Sun at the same speed as the Earth, keeping it in a stable position. This is a generation-defining launch, and I'm extremely excited to see the amazing images that will no doubt be captured during the telescope's life. The final expected launch of the week will be on Christmas Day, the 25th of December, when China will launch a Long March 4C with an Earth observation satellite on board as well as an amateur radio CubeSat. Both payloads will be placed into low Earth orbit. And that is the final expected launch of the week, and therefore the end of this installment of Space This Week. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next Monday. My life will be pretty hectic over the next week due to the whole Christmas and New Year thing, so in all likelihood it'll be the first time in the whole of 2021 where there won't be an episode of Space This Week. Don't worry, I'll make up to you all. The following Monday we'll do a Space This Fortnite or something, and I'll probably make a Space This Year video as well, summarising all the highlights and milestones that 2021 brought to us. What's been your highlight of the year? For me, that award is watching SN15's high altitude flight test and watching it absolutely nail the landing. I also enjoy admiring the names of all my wonderful Patreon supporters who can be seen scrolling on the left of your screens. And I must once again give a big shout out to all my channel members as well who get these videos one day early. That's why you sometimes see comments down there that are a bit older than the publication time of the video. And if you enjoyed the video, then do remember to give it a little like. And if either of the video suggestions on screen look interesting to you, then why not give one of them a watch? or both of them will watch. Anyway, that's all from me, so big thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.